so the title of the talk is Data Pipelines with Celery, Modular, Signal Driven and Manageable. Uh, what we will be talking about today are some of the pros and cons and use cases where we used Celery uh, for data pipelining for collecting, transforming and storing data. So who am I? Uh, I'm a software engineer at Seek and Hit, which is a digital marketing and uh, software engineering agency. We are also a KiwiCom vendor who is one of the sponsors of this uh, EuroPython. Uh, as for my work, I'm a member of MarTech, which is marketing uh, technology. If someone doesn't know, uh, MarTech Automation team. We collaborate with KiwiCom, SEO, SCM, and other teams, which basically means that we have a lot of uh, data pipelines and a lot of background processes that need to be run on a regular schedule. My own personal interests include scalable systems and data engineering. And with that, let's start with what do we mean by data pipelines in, cel in Celery. So when we talk about data pipelines, we mean a ser series of processes for collecting, transforming, and storing data. And Celery, I'm sure most of you at least have heard of it, is a distributed task queue framework. Now, if we visualize a data pipeline in its most basic form, it would look something like this, where we have three steps that are connected in a series, where we collect, transform, and export or store some data. Um, when we are talking about data pipelines and salary, we are talking uh, actually about ch basically chains which means that we chain tasks into a series that executes some, some work. And here's a small code example, if you can see it, uh, of how we define it. So let's start with the pros and cons of using Celery for data pipelining. So uh, the first pro, first we'll go through the pros. So basically, uh, Celery allows us scalability, so we can add more worker nodes when needed. We have a signal-driven architecture, as we will see uh, later in the presentation, that allows us to actually hook into the lifecycle of tasks, and in more general, in the lifecycle of the pipeline, to perform some additional work. Um, integration, so it can be integrated with other environments. The most uh, basic example is with Django. Uh, it's easy to use and flexible. Basically, uh, if you know how to write Python functions, uh, a Celery task can like encompass whatever a Python function can do, and it encompasses the same logic, so the learning curve is uh, a little smoother than other than some other data pipeline uh, frameworks. Uh, as for the cons, so there is a setup and maintenance compl complexity. So as you get more, uh, uh, as your application scales more and more and becomes larger, it's more difficult to maintain to set up it and maintain it. Uh, the issue is dependency on message brokers, which adds some infrastructure costs. So uh, at our team, we, uh, we use Redis all of the time. Some, someone else might prefer RabbitMQ or something else. Uh, so since we have this step of using message brokers, like to communicate, uh, we introduce latency, so worker-broker communication. And there is a, there are limited data pipeline features, of course, because uh, because Celery is like general purpose task messaging queue, so some of the features require custom development. So with that said, what are the challenges in data processing? So what are the things that we need to take 
care about. Uh, first, it's idempotency, uh, which basically means that restarting the pipeline or the task should, uh, uh, should produce the same result no matter how many times the task is restarted. Uh, we need to, uh, the challenge is also to efficiently handle large data sets, like we need to be able to process the data within a reasonable time. Uh, and we need to be able to handle API limits and ensure the maximum utilization of API uh, requests uh, within those allocated limits. Uh, isolate failures. Uh, so we need to be able to manage and handle failures at each step. Uh, there are multiple times when we like when we would want to make an API request or store some data. We first need to load it from Redis. Then we need to like if anything fails, we need to return it so that we know where we left off to continue continue uh, processing, and these failures can happen. And also we should like um, isolate uh, all of the uh, work that needs to be done that's not related to the main pipeline output. And of course, Modularity, we want to break down complex tasks and complex pipelines into more manageable ones, uh, ones that, that are self-contained. So how we used to do things, for example, um, gathering keyword metrics for an API for uh, one and a half million rows. So let's be real, this is not exactly that large of a data set. It's maybe medium-sized, but how would we do it? We would like load some data to Redis first using the first pipeline. Then the second pipeline would periodically load a batch of rows and make some API requests for that batch. Uh, we would get back some results from the API and we would store the new data again to Redis and then we would have a fourth pipeline, periodically load a batch of the new data and make, again, API requests. So we're basically having four pipelines for something that should be, uh, that, that should be much, much simpler. Uh, the issues were that we had processing idleness, that we weren't processing data as fast as we could. So, uh, for example, uh, we would schedule the pipeline to run every two minutes, uh, but in reality, we would only need, like, for example, 80 seconds um, uh, to process everything, and then after 80 seconds, we would be able to make another API request, but we weren't utilizing it. We were, like, um, we were wasting 40 seconds on each on each on each uh, run, which meant that those 40 seconds would accumulate and we weren't processing all of the data as we should. Um, then another issue was between pipeline resource synchronization. So at, uh, when you have like uh, pipelines that run over multiple days and that are constantly uh, being scheduled, uh, and additionally are interconnected by some logic, then you need to introduce some mutex variable to sync's resource access. And uh, this may be the worst thing for me, personally. Um, this also, uh, we had increased maintenance complexity because developers needed to carefully sync the schedules between the pipelines, they needed to think uh, when the first pipeline will run, the second, third, fourth, and they would also need to know about the mutex variable, the states that the variable can be in. So this was really a pain. And of course, all this increases development time. Uh, 
so we decided to go up with a new approach where we um, basically utilize Celery signals to hook up uh, other pipelines or tasks at different points of a pipeline's execution. Uh, yeah, basically what I just said, hook on a specific life cycle of event, of a task or a step in a pipeline. And uh, not sure if you saw, if you used Celery signals, but this is an example of how you can set a basic hello world signal. So when uh, the hello task is finished, when it's completed co uh, correctly, then the post run trigger um, is called and it triggers the world task. So that's basically the basis for our new approach. Uh, I'm going to go uh, through a few of uh, the use cases that, that, we, uh, that I have prepared. So in this first use case, we are making API requests based on data from a database. So basically we have an analyst, a stakeholder, that prepares a query for us, and then we need to run that to gather the data, and based on that data, we need to make some API requests. Just for note that we're using uh, BigQuery. Now the issue with this uh, use case is that the API requests uh, had an impact on net revenue, um, which meant that we needed to be careful. Uh, so what we did, we decided that, okay, you want us to make those requests you know, uh, based on that data that you provide us, but what if something goes wrong in the future? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to store the results of the query uh, and we wanted to store all of the failed API requests so that any, uh, at any point in time in the future, we can uh, check out what went wrong. So we want need to send the API requests in batches. That's our main goal. But what we proposed is not something that's for the stakeholders or the, for, for the business or the main goal of the pipeline. So it's basically a side job to store the historical logs and the log of failed requests. So if we stick to our old approach, then the pipelines would look something like this. We would have two pipelines one that flushes the Redis, uh, reads the SQL file, loads and stores the data that was gathered from Redis, and then we would have a periodic task that is run uh, every, let's say, two or five minutes, load batch from Redis, make API requests or failed requests, and at the end, signal that, that it's done. With the new approach, we broke it down to something like this. So basically, the First pipeline, the flush Redis, Red SQL, and load and store to Redis remains the same. But now using Celery signals and passing the job ID, we trigger an additional task that stores the query results to a table. And also we use the signal to load, uh, to trigger the next pipeline. So the next pipeline will load some data uh, in a batch from Redis, make an API request, and then we have another signal to store the failed API requests. So basically, if anything goes wrong in the store failed requests or store query results to table, then uh, this won't affect the main pipeline. Uh, and when we're done with a single batch for the API, for the, let's say, first API request, the end task sends a signal that will restart the pipeline again to load the next batch. So we're not wasting time waiting for the celery beat or waiting every two minutes for the, for the next run. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much sense it uh, makes to have this here, but I just wanted to give a quick overview like how we do it, we get to the table by name, 
we have a delete from the destination table query. And we have some transform column function. And at the end, we upload the data frame to, to the table. So here in this point, I just wanted to point out, I already mentioned that we that one of the challenges is that we need to make sure that the tasks are idempotent. And one of the ways we're doing it here is if the task is restarted, then this query delete from the table will delete based on the task ID that was stored. Um, as for the signal function, so store failed requests, we have these two post run connects just to show that you can connect like different tasks, multiple tasks to the same, to the same handler. Uh, and also you can do some like state checks and check if there is any data to run the next pipeline or not. So, so the second use case, um, generating text using uh, an LLM API. So LLMs are like everything today. And of course, we also wanted to use them. Um, but of course, the API has a one request per minute limit. So it's a limit that we need to like take into account. Um, how did we do it? So, we want to, okay, we want to respect the API ra rate limit and we want to separate the API requests and text upload. So we want to have like uh, one data pipeline that will keep sending API requests to the LLM API to get the text back and we want that pipeline to store that data somewhere. And then we have, have another pipeline that will just upload, dump the text wherever, wherever we need them. So how did we do it? So the upper pipeline, it checks whether any prompts were inputted, loads them, makes the API requests, and waits for the API time limit to end. Once the API time limit ended, we go to the end task uh, and re-trigger the the pipeline from the start, and also trigger the other pipeline to upload the text uh, text to some bucket or whatever destination that we want to upload them to. Uh, okay, and this third case for me, it's a, basically a fun case. Um, so we have this internal API that also, of course, has some limits, but this one has some daily limits. It has a limit of 10 requests per day, and it has a limit of, I think, 1,000 rows per, per day, so not, not much data, but it was a fun little experiment where we kind of, again, made the pipeline um, basically as a for loop. So we load some data from, the, uh, from Redis, we make an API request to the internal API, and we finish task. Then in the handler, we do some additional checks and um, calculate the parameters for the next pipeline run. So basically, when the pipeline finishes, uh, we check whether the task finished successfully, we get the iteration count, we get the routes per request limit, daily request limit, and we calculate how many rows the next run of the pipeline uh, will load from Redis. Um, that's, and then we send these parameters to the next, to the next uh, pipeline call, to the next pipeline run uh, in the last line. It, hopefully you can see it. Uh, that's why I mentioned that we the, this is a fun case where we ba basically created a for loop using 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 uh, these salary signals. So uh, consider using signals if you want to break apart large chains. 
Um, and you can also check whether uh, the next salary chain or the next tasks uh, should execute. Uh, consider them if you seem to be scheduling too many periodic tasks. So if your developers are taking more than um, five minutes to like decide when this should be scheduled, then something, something might be off. And you have secondary work that needs to be done, as we, uh, as we saw in the first use case, where you want to store some historical logs. Um, so you don't want that secondary work to interfere with the main pipeline, with the main goal of it. If you want to try to avoid some loop in, loops in your tasks. So basically, here the pipeline is triggering itself. Um, some of these, some of the use cases may have been create, uh, may have been modified in a way that you actually have some nested for loops to send the data in batches. Uh, but from my experience, what I've found is that that makes the code less readable, and it takes much more effort to actually debug and find the issues when they occur and um, handle the errors. Thank you. Uh, just allow me to thank Kiwi.com for their support in preparing this presentation. Uh, if you want to follow Kiwi's tech content, you can scan the QR code or you can uh, check out the booth. Um, also, just to mention, uh, if anyone wants to talk to me, I'll be at the booth later. And if you want to get in contact, here are my contact details. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot for this very nice talk. Um, Q&A wise, we would ask you to queue up on that microphone in the middle of the rows. So just feel free to come up and queue up and ask your questions. We've got perfectly five minutes left for the Q&A. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, one question is that you, from what I understand, you can trigger multiple tasks with one task. So uh, like a one to n relationship. Is there any way to trigger multiple tasks? I guess so, but is there also a way to um, have one task triggered if three other tasks, for example, completed? So like a w n to one relationship? Uh, okay, so basically, uh, uh, whenever a task is finished, uh, at the lifecycle signals are connected to a single task. So what you could do is to uh, add a task to the end of your uh, three tasks that you want to execute, and then hook the signal to that one task. So basically, I don't think, I mean, Celery doesn't support it out of the box that three tasks trigger one, but you can have three like in a group and then have another task chained after it and when that task is finished, trigger something else. Thank you. If there is no further questions, I would ask you to give another warm round of applause for Marine.